So welcome to lecture number 17. Uh, we are continuing our discussion on the theory of plate tectonics. Um, and last time we had an introduction, we, we saw how we, <clears throat> how this theory was uh, built based on two hypotheses, the continental drift hypothesis uh, and the uh, seafloor spreading hypothesis. And the arguments that were brought in favor and support of these two hypotheses. So today we are going to look at the actual um, <clears throat> facts uh, specified by by the theory. Um, we, we are going to look at plate boundaries, the different types of plate boundaries, um, and then we'll discuss very briefly the plate driving forces, and we will end with the supercontinent cycle. You may or may not have heard about this. It's very interesting. Um, so stay tuned. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, if you remember, you've seen this slide uh, in the previous lecture. The idea is that according to the theory, plate tectonics, uh, the lithosphere of uh, the Earth is uh, segmented, is divided into a number of plates uh, that move relative uh, one to another. Um, and they move relative to the asthenosphere. And uh, as they move, the idea is that the plates are rigid, but the deformation uh, is uh, concentrated at the boundaries. So you, you, you remember that um, slide with the uh, focus of the earthquakes, uh, and in the case of the continental lithosphere, you've seen that the boundaries are more diffuse. So the formation happens uh, over a wider region. So let's talk about the different types of plate boundaries. Um, the classification is quite clear, uh, quite clear. We have these three types. Uh, so the ones that we call uh, constructive or divergent or spreading. So these are the mid ocean ridges. So the, it's constructive because new lithosphere is being formed there, divergent because they diverge. The other, uh, the second type is what we call destructive or convergent. Uh, what happens here is that the, uh, the plates um, move toward each other and one of them is being subducted. Uh, which means the destruction of the lithosphere because it sinks into the mantle and conversion because they come together. Um, and the third type is what's called the conservative type of boundary. That means that there is no construction or no destruction. It's conservative. Nothing happens in, in terms of generating new lithosphere or uh, getting rid of old lithosphere. <laughs> so it's just that the plates slide past each other uh, at these type of boundaries. They are uh, also called transform boundaries and uh, the type of fault is called transform fault, um, if you want. But we, we, we uh, will see, we will detail now each of these types. Uh, just to have one more time a look at uh, the plates, the, pre the, the first slide I was showing you it was showing you the, the plates uh, with their names. Now, we don't have the names of, of the actual plates, but what I want you to see, I want you to see these three types of plate boundaries, which are color coded. So the divergent ones, the constructive boundaries, which are the mid ocean ridges, are depicted here in green, green color. So you see them generally in the oceans, yeah, in the oceans, in the Atlantic Ocean, in the uh, Indian Ocean, you see, uh, you see uh, here, and here we have the meeting of three. You see three mid-ocean ridges. Um, in the Pacific, you see uh, where the boundary goes, and we in red we have the subduction uh, zones. Uh, basically, these are the destructive or convergent boundaries, and here. Uh, in the case of Colombia uh, and all western part of South America, the Pacific coast of South America, this is a convergent boundary. 
Um, and um, you can see uh, that these boundaries of convergence, they extend in some cases, uh, in the case of the Alpine uh, Himalayan belt, you see here the boundary. Now, of course, what happens here, and we will discuss this when we discuss about orogens, uh, the final stages of the development uh, for genic belts, we have what's called collision. So there is no longer subduction because you have parts of two continental blocks, in this case, in the case of India, and none of it, uh, it can subduct. They are too buoyant, you know, too light, so they cannot sink. So we have collision and the formation of a collisional orogenic belt, the Himalayas in this case, but we will discuss about it. Yeah. So it, we, we will have uh, a few, um, few classes where we discuss about the, the orogenic belts. We'll discuss about the Andes, we'll discuss about the Himalayas. All right, and finally, um, Can yes, ask you a question? absolutely, yes. Uh, yes David. It's hard for me to imagine, maybe because I don't know, for me, when you talk about convergent or or destructive, I will imagine that the convergence are actually constructing origin belts and the ones that are divergent that you call constructing are the ones that are destroying. I don't know if I'm answering, uh, asking. No, uh, I, I'll explain to you uh, and to your colleagues uh, as well. Uh, I actually thank you for, uh, uh, um, for asking this because it's good not to have doubts. Yeah. So the idea is that we talk in terms of formation or destruction of the lithospheric plate. Yeah. So so you are talking about the formation or destruction of the lithospheric plate, not the formation of a neurogenic belt. There are different things. So what happens when you have the divergent boundaries, and I'll show you in the next slide. We call them constructive because new lithosphere is being formed there. And at the subduction zones, what happens when you have one lithospheric plate subducting, this lithospheric plate goes down into the mantle and sinks into the mantle. So what happens, the lithospheric plate is being dis destroyed here. And as this process co continues, at some point, even a, a, um, a ridge, yeah, okay, David, even a ridge can be subducted and the notion in the end will close, will close. And what will happen in the end, it will close and you'll have a collision. So there, this is a cycle I'm anticipating a bit. It, it, this is a Wilson cycle or supercontinent cycle and you'll see in a bit. It's very interesting, but I think it's good you asked it because, you know, if you have something that kind of bothers you, you, I don't want you to learn things just to memorize them. Yeah, we, you, we don't memorize things. We, we have to learn the logic of things. So, uh, good, David, uh, thank you for asking. Um, just the third type of boundary, the, the transform fault, and here it says transform fault fracture zone in the legend. So what happens here is that uh, you'll see, um, they, they look to you like fractures. Um, the part that we call fold, and it is like a slight uh, strike slip fold, it's only a segment that is active. The rest is a fracture. But as you can see, basically, they link different segments, in this case, of the mid-ocean ridges. That's, uh, that's one case. Now, you have here a very famous uh, transform fault and a conservative boundary uh, here in California for instance, um, and it's called the San Andreas Fault. Another famous one you see it here in Turkey is the North Anatolian Fault. We'll talk about them. So we, it's just our first introduction. All right, so here, let's look a bit at these boundaries. So here you see, you can, in the literature, you will encounter this type of names, constructive, divergent, or spreading. Now, constructive, as David pointed out, uh, why, why we, we would call it constructive, just in a bit, in the next slide. But the idea is what happens is, topographically, if you go, uh, if you go on the bottom of the ocean, uh, and this is what 
uh, this previous slide uh, shows, so mid, mid ocean, because you see in the case of the Atlantic, it's kind of right in the middle, yeah? Uh, mid Indian, if you want, wherever the middle is. In the Pacific, it's not really in the middle, but you understand the idea. It is in the ocean on the bottom. You have this huge, huge, very long mountain belt, planetary long mountain belt, like, look at it, like this. Look at it, goes like this, goes like this, goes like this. This is, if you were to uh, drain the water, so we had no water and you could walk, then you would see all these, uh, what we call today mid-ocean ridges as uh, topography, yeah, as uh, mountain topography. So this is uh, what the mid-ocean ridges are. So what happens here, you have melts, yeah, so molten rock, yeah, molten rock. So the melts rise up from the asthenosphere. So what happens is um, these melts rise up in, into the oceanic lithosphere here at the mid-ocean ridge axis. Um, and then basically um, the composition of these melts is basaltic and depending where where it solidifies. So if it comes to the surface, any magma that goes to the surface is called lava. So if it comes to the surface and becomes lava, then it, it is a basaltic lava. And in, in the case of the basalts that form at mid-ocean ridges, we call them pillow basalts. The reason we call them pillow basalts is because they take a certain um, mesoscopic, so we can see it with the naked eye, uh, texture or, or structure, better said. So what happens is um, the, the lava is very hot and the water is cold yeah, at the bottom of the ocean. So the, it, it is the, the fact that the molten material, when it encounters the, the cold water, it kind of uh, it takes a shape like a, like this uh, the side of a pillow. Yeah, so that's why it's called pillow basalt. Um, so the idea is that this molten material, it goes up, and you can form if it forms at the depth. The rock that is uh, formed is called gabbro. It has the same composition as basalt. I I assume you haven't studied yet petrology. You will study it with Marcos, I think. He's a, a, our petrologist. But anyway, the idea is that uh, rocks have different chemical compositions. However, texturally speaking, in terms of the texture, you have in terms of the igneous rocks, you have the rocks that form from lava. So there is rapid, rapid crystallization because of the large difference in temperature. So the crystals are very small. So in this case of this type of uh, material of this composition, the rock formed at the surface called basalt. When it forms a depth, so it cools slowly, the crystals have a larger size, and then the rock that is formed is called gabbro. But in terms of composition, gabbro and basalt, they are similar. It's just that the texture is different. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. So, this material goes, and then part of it intrudes and forms gabbro. Part goes through cracks, yeah, and forms what's called basalt dikes. Uh, and part of it goes to the surface and forms pillow basalt. So what happens here, what happens here, imagine this in the context of what we, we were discussing last time. So at the mid-ocean ridges, you have in the axis, you have in the axis, new lithospheric material that is being formed there. So basically new material is added to form the plate. And what happens, this is a boundary between two plates. So the material comes up, solidifies, forms, so adds a bit to the plates and then moves away. We don't have gaps in the, in the lithosphere. It's not like you go, you go there and look down and you say, oh, now I can see the astronosphere. You can imagine this is a process that only the tendency to, to, to split apart will draw 
new material in. Yeah, so that's what happens. But if we are to kind of think about the sequence of events, it's like this. There is this stress that pulls apart, yeah, that pulls apart the two plates and new material comes in to fill the gap, solidifies. So the plate is being built up on one side and on the other. So that's what happens. This is a process of forming what's called new ocean floor, actually new, uh, new oceanic lithosphere. And as you can see, due to the seafloor spreading, as you can see, as you go away from the mid ocean ridges, as we discussed, the age of the oceanic lithosphere is uh, older and older. Yeah, that's what happens. Good, so I think this is kind of clear, the mechanism. Now, let's look at some examples. We, we either take a submarine and go and, and look at the mid ocean ridges uh, and there are various phenomena associated with them and very interesting. But one place on the planet where the ridge has a surface expression exposed to the air, if you want it, is Iceland. Now, Iceland also coincides with a mantle plume, with a hotspot. So that's why you have this build up of um, igneous material around the ridge. Uh, but the idea is that Iceland sits right on the mid, uh, mid Atlantic ridge. And then actually you can say that one part of Iceland is on one lithospheric plate. The other part is on the other lithospheric plate, yeah, the North American and the Eurasian. So these are uh, images showing you surface expressions of the cracks at the surface associated with the mid ocean ridge. And Iceland is a very, uh, is a place with active volcanism. You know that. So there are eruptions and there are uh, recurrent um, formations of, uh, of um, new and additions of new material uh, at these places where you have these cracks. All right, so all, all you see here, all you see here is volcanic material, obviously. Now, Let's go to the opposite, the opposite, uh, what we call destructive or consuming. I, I forgot about consuming or converging. Yeah? So uh, you, you can see the parallel, yeah? Constructive, yeah? Constructive uh, was here, yeah? Divergent, convergent, yeah? Spreading, consuming. So what happens here, we have converging plates. You can look at this. Yeah, you can look at this diagram. I have converging uh, plates, but there is one rule of the game here. At these convergent boundaries, there is only one type of uh, of uh, lithosphere that can subduct, and that is the dense, dense oceanic lithosphere. Now, the dense oceanic lithosphere, as the lithosphere, as it goes away from the ridge, the actual lithosphere, its thickness increases. You remember because the base of the lithosphere is an isotherm. It's not, so it's, it's, it's defined by a physical property boundary. It's not actually, it's not actually a compositional boundary. So the lithosphere, the oceanic lithosphere, as it, as it goes away, it becomes thicker and it becomes colder and it becomes denser. And because of this, at some point, when it's cold and thick and dense enough, it can sink. That's the idea. So, so only dense oceanic lithosphere can sink under another lithospheric plate. The other lithospheric plate can have oceanic lithosphere or can have continental lithosphere, doesn't matter. But the continental lithosphere cannot sink. Continents are thick, and the uh, the density of continent it's it's lighter. Yeah, it's less than the density of the uh, oceanic lithosphere. So what happens? They are buoyant. They are not gonna sink. So that's one rule of the game. So you can see uh, there are people who did calculations, and they say, well, once the oceanic lithosphere gets older than ten million years it becomes denser than the asthenosphere. So it can, it has the conditions 
uh, to sync uh, if it encounters a convergent boundary. Um, this process, we call it subduction. And the zones where it occurs is the, are the subduction zones. Um, so the conclusion of this rule of the game is that we don't have oceanic lithosphere that is older than 180 million years old. Uh, because the older, the one before 180 million years, so we talk about Mesozoic here, has uh, has sunk all right, already, yeah, no longer exists, was subducted. So, but we have the very old continental crust because the continental lithosphere cannot cannot sink. So, uh, with the formation of and the uh, growth of the continents, yeah, the continents actually. Um, exist there they are not going to be destroyed that's the idea it's only the oceanic lithosphere that is being destroyed all right so one thing about it let's look now at the geologic features of a convergent plate boundary here are you you see these names you see the names here um so just to go through them a bit when we discuss about orogenic belts we will discuss, for instance, about what a thrust belt is. Here in Bogota, we are in a thrust belt. Yeah, we are basically, you, you can imagine this is a case that corresponds to the Andes. And in the in the case of the Andes, for instance, that's a situation what you uh, what you have. Uh, an orogenic belt like the Andes has a complexity. So it has a it has a cordillera, which is uh, like the central cordillera, which has a volcanic arcs. But then, like the oriental cordillera here, this is a thrust belt. And we will see when we talk about the origins, what it, this means. But these are the geologic features associated with a convergent boundary. So the subduction happens here. Uh, this is a subduction zone. But here, first of all, you have the trench axis. So the, this is a deep sea trench. Yeah, this is the topographic expression of the beginning of the subduction zone. And as you know, in the Pacific Ocean with the Mariana Trench, Kuriles Trench, or you have all these trenches, Fiji Trench, uh, the Mariana Trench being the deepest, 11 kilometers down. So recently someone went there <laughs> uh, with, a, with a little summary. So these are the deep sea trenches. The, it's the topographic expression of the place where subduction initiates. And then you have, as you were to do a cross section, as you see, you have this uh, body, what that we call accretionary prism. So accretionary prism, the significance, geological significance of the accretionary prism is that the oceanic lithosphere carries sediments, yeah, carries sediments. And when you have the subduction, as I said, we don't have gaps, we don't have you know holes in the in the <laughs> in the lithosphere to look for. So uh, you can imagine the, the plate which is above will scrape, yeah, will scrape these sediments, yeah, these sediments from the subducting plate. So this is this mass of sediment, yeah, mass of sediment that is scraped off the seafloor. And these are an accretionary priest. And I'll show you when we talk about the uh, origin belts what the accretionary priest look like, geologically speaking, what an afflorimental looks like, and so on. So it's a, uh, it, uh, and there are a, a special type of metamorphic rocks from the, the base of this uh, accretionary priest called blue schists. And um, then, uh, well, I haven't mentioned it here, but here is basically something that is called a four arc basin. Now, four, four arc means in front of the arc, in front of the arc. So you see the four arc basin basically is between the actual uh, volcanic arc and the accretionary priest. Yeah, so between this, you have this four arc basin. And then, then we have the volcanic arc. So what happens with the volcanic arc? This is what this diagram tries to show. What happens is, uh, and again, this is a thing that you will learn in the course, uh, in the petrology course. Uh, what happens is that you may wonder how the melts are generated at depth, what causes the rock to melt. 
and one of the causes of the rocks uh, in certain conditions, high uh, pressure, high temperature, one of the causes is the addition of volatiles, yeah, of volatiles. Like in this case, what happens, the subducting, the subducting plate is hydrated. It has water, it has carbon dioxide. As it goes down, you can imagine the pressure and temperature conditions change. So the rocks undergo metamorphism. When they are undergo metamorphism, the, mi the hydrated minerals will lose the water. Yeah, will lose the water. And so there is water being expelled, uh, carbon dioxide being expelled, and the new minerals are formed. So what happens, the addition of these volatiles that come from, from the, um, from the uh, dehydration, from the dehydration of the subducting plate will cause, will cause uh, melting in this part of the uh, asthenosphere, in this asthenospheric wedge. So the melts will ascend, will ascend through the lithosphere, through the overriding plate. And there is an evolution in, in, in the melts. You'll also learn about it in the petrology course. Uh, petrology is a fantastic uh, field of inquiry, in my opinion. It's really interesting. It's very complex, extremely complex. But what happens is, uh, you, you have to imagine that everything, actually what we are studying, we are studying physics. We are studying how matter evolves under different conditions in very comp uh, and different uh, chemical environments. So that's what we are studying. So in this case, the melts, as they are formed in the astronosphere, they will ascend through the lithosphere, but they will evolve. Their chemistry will change as well. So it, they, they will pick also material from the um, segment of the lithosphere they, that they cross as well. So what happens is that eventually you have some magma going into the crust and to the surface becoming lava. So you have the formation of a chain of volcanoes on the edge of the overriding plate. So where you have subduction, you have this Volcanism. And there are two types of volcanic arcs. Are the volcanic island arcs, like in the western side of the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, so when you look at all these, at the, like the Philippines, uh, Fiji, all these islands uh, on the western side, they are volcanic island arcs. Yeah, Indonesia. But on the eastern side of the South Pacific, we have South America. And we have a continent. So this will be a continental volcanic arc that extends from uh, here uh, and from Central America as well. Uh, but in the case of South America, it extends from Colombia down to Chile. That's what happens. So uh, one more thing here, um, earthquakes. So we have seen, we have seen that in the zones of subduction, we have also seismicity. And Earthquakes occur along a zone, which is called Wadati Benioff zone. That's from the names of people who actually defined it. These people were seismologists, and they were noticing that these places that are associated with the with the deep ocean trenches, because it, this theory was put together uh, by having various types of observations. Some people observed what I was showing you last time, uh, and they came up with the idea of the seafloor spreading. But the idea of subduction and, uh, came after people realized that something happens. There is a zone where things are dynamic, uh, happen. And this is the Wadati Benioff zone. Uh, and this is uh, considered to be basically to reflect the subduction process. So you would have earthquakes at convergent plate boundaries. Uh, and these earthquakes go down in terms of their uh, foci, uh, the, their hypocenters go down to about 670 kilometers. So you would have a lot of earthquakes which are very shallow, yeah, very shallow uh, between zero and 20 kilometers. And they happen, as you can see, they happen both in the 
subducting plate and in the overriding plate here. So basically, you can imagine that you have the process of thrusting, yeah, thrusting underneath the uh, uh, the overriding plate, and you have a reverse faulting into the uh, overriding plate. So this is what explains this uh, this um, seismicity. Uh, but then you have intermediate and deep uh, deep uh, earthquakes. And you may ask me, well, didn't we learn? Didn't we learn that beyond a certain temperature, the material should be plastic? So how come we have, <laughs> how come we have uh, brittle manifestations? How, how how come that we have failure in a brittle manner to generate earthquakes? So what happens is, uh, it, it's um, the idea is that down to about 300 kilometers, it is believed that that the a uh, downgoing slab, the subducting oceanic lithosphere, is strong and cool enough to, to stay brittle. So you can imagine what happens with the isotherms here, they go down like this, the isotherms, because, you know, it, it's like you take, let's say, you take something, a, a cold object, yeah, you take it from the fridge, let's say you, you put a plate uh, in the fridge and keep it there and it's cold. And then you fill your bathtub with cold, with warm water, yeah, and put the plate in like this. Now, for a while, the plate will still be cold, yeah. It will take a bit of time until the plate warms up, warms up, and takes the temperature of the uh, surrounding water. So it's the same with, with with this downgoing plate. It is cold, yeah. So basically, it's still brittle. Uh, down to about 300 kilometers. Now, beyond that, when it's hot enough, you may wonder, well, why would we have uh, real failure? It is believed that what happens is you, you might have sudden mineralogical changes, so sudden changes that could trigger this. Of course, uh, the deeper we go in the air, the more difficult for us is to understand the physics of what's happening because we cannot get there. But I think here, uh, this is the case. All right, so so very interesting phenomena, very interesting. And uh, believe me, all of these, although they are in this theory, are still a matter of uh, research, of active research. And I just want to, to um, illustrate to you this uh, in the next slide. So for instance, you can see this is a, a paper that was published in 2015, not long time ago, yeah? So you can see people, these people come from Japan. So in Japan, it's normal. They sit at the subducting zone. They have a lot of earthquakes, as you know, <laughs> and uh, some are very damaging. And of course, you have people that dedicate their careers to studying this. So here, look at this. Let's look at the title. It says background size misty rate at subduction zone linked to slab bending related hydration. So I'm not going to read now the abstract. You will read it just to try to understand what these people are talking about. If you are interested, you can download this paper from here. I, I give you the uh, link. You can download it and then you can read it if you find it interesting. But it, this is just to illustrate how complex things are um, and also to stimulate your imagination, to, to, to show you a path that you can, if you are interested, you can become a researcher in a lot of things. Yeah, that's the idea, whatever interests you. So let's look at what these people say just very briefly. I just put here one of their figures. What we notice here, if you don't read the te text and you look at just at the figure, you notice that they show two situations. They show a subducting plate, but with different angles. You see that the one in A has a steeper angle. Yeah. And uh, here, the bending angle, angle is, is small. So what they are talking about, they are saying, well, because of the bending here, you have these faults being developed. Yeah, you have these faults. Um, and what they say is that you, uh, as the plate goes down, 
as the plate goes down, you have metamorphism, you have water being expelled, goes along these fractures. But also, you remember we discussed about the pore fluid pressure. So the pore fluid pressure, they say here, it increases, so it triggers failure along pre-existing uh, structures. Here, the failure ca can be here along the thrust zone, or it can be on pre-existing faults, as you can see. So what is very interesting, they say, well, mechanically speaking, if the angle of subduction is steeper, we are going to see more earthquakes. And they are linking this to this hydration, dehydration, pore increase, uh, pore pressure increase. So quite complex, but also very interesting, as opposed to the regions where we have the, the bending of the slab being more shallow. And they say, well, there you don't have so many earthquakes. So that's the idea. You might even have some zones that are locked and so on. So if you are interested, you can read about this uh, just to get an idea and to, to have a feel for how, uh, you know, you have many, many things that when we study in that detail, we have to understand. All right, so this being said, just to show you some examples. Um, well, in this case, instead of showing you the Andes, because you will be discussing about the Andes, I decided to show you something from very far away <laughs> on the Northern side uh, in the Aleutian Islands. So you see, this is Alaska, all right? So this is Alaska and this is a Bering Sea and the, then is a Bering Strait and on the other side is Russia with the Kamchatka Peninsula. So this, you can see the Aleutian Arc volcanoes. Yeah? We see this string. Yeah? So this is a, a, a very good example of a volcanic arc associated with a convergent boundary. You can see images of the volcanoes, like this obviously is from a plane or helicopter. This one is from the satellite. So you see what the image of a volcano is from the satellite as opposed to being very close to the uh, volcanic cone. I hear another uh, image showing an eruption uh, of these active volcanoes. Uh, island of Java, for instance, uh, I was mentioning Indonesia. Indonesia has volcanism, active volcanism, and all these uh, situations. And um, another example is the Andean volcanic arc that we mentioned. So. The third type of plate boundary uh, is one that we call conservative or transform. Conservative means there is no change. It's conservative. There, there is no destruction, you know, no destruction or no construction. So what happens is that as you have seen in the map, the mid-ocean ridges uh, are segmented. Yeah, they are segmented. They have short segments and they appear to be linked by fracture zones. And initially, people were thinking, well, here what we have, basically, uh, this is the old idea. Uh, the, the ridge is offset by faults. But this was not a very good idea. I mean, it's a, an idea that made sense initially because you didn't know about what else could be. But then people thought kinematically, OK, they were offset. But how come that they got offset? What caused this offset? Because we had the ridge, we have this movement, as you can see. The movement here is like this, and this arrow along the of, uh, displacement along the, the fold is the opposite. So how come? So Tuzo Wilson, who was um, one of the con big contributors to the theory of plate tectonics, uh, J. Tuzo, Tuzo Wilson, um, who was a professor in Toronto, and um, my <laughs> my. Uh, uh, master supervisor in Toronto, uh, a professor called Henry Holtz from uh, England. He came to Canada actually from England because Tuzo Wilson brought him. So actually he knew. And so I met these people who knew Tuzo Wilson. Of course, he died some time ago. Um, so I couldn't, uh, I couldn't meet Tuzo Wilson. But uh, of course, people in the department in Toronto are very proud of the fact that Tuzo Wilson was a member of their department, being a big pioneer in um, in uh, the plate tectonic theory. So you'll see him mentioned twice in this lecture. First time is now, because what he proposed is that actually these are not 
the classic style um, faults, uh, strikes, deep faults, uh, that he proposed basically that these are fracture zones that actually formed at the same time as the ridge. And what happened here, he, he, he said, well, if you look in this, in this image, bottom panel to the left, if you look, you see X and Y. The only active zone is between X and Y. So basically, it is like as you have a zigzag, yeah? And you move these things, and then to accommodate the offset that existed from the beginning in the rift to accommodate this offset, the transform, the transform fault exists there, yeah? So this is the transform plate boundary. So you see the movement is compatible. So basically new lithosphere is generated here, new lithosphere is generated here. They move past one another, yeah, that's what they do. But then when they get to the points X and Y, they join with the other part of the lithosphere that moves in the same direction and they are no longer active. They don't move one relative to the other with different speeds. What they do, they go together. So it's like just a, an inherited fracture zone. So that's what the idea is. And his hypothesis or uh, hypothesis of Tuzo Wilson is that it was confirmed by the earthquake data, which earthquake data shows that the earthquakes are actually localized in this segment. And then uh, the fault becomes, it's no longer a fault. It's not active. It's a fracture inherited. Yeah, it's a, this zone inherited from the active part. So now if you are not convinced about this, just this diagram will explain it better. So you see actually what happens. Yeah. So basically the boundary, you see the ocean ridge, this is boundary between these two plates. And this is boundary between these two plates. So the, the connection here is accommodating kinematically the movement. Yeah. So it's like we start generating lithosphere here in this segment. And we start generating it here in this segment. So along this part, we have to accommodate this. So the lithosphere here moves along this side. This is the upper plate. So you have plate B and plate A here. So you can imagine what happens. So <clears throat> this is explained here. Uh, so you have uh, this strike slip fold just between these two uh, segments of the ridge. Now, in most cases, the transform boundaries, they link mid-ocean ridge segments, as I'm showing you here, but not always. We can have, uh, we can have transform uh, boundaries that link trenches or link a trench to a ridge segment. Yeah, so that's the idea. And in some cases, these transform boundaries, they extend in, uh, uh, in the continental uh, part of, the, of some uh, plates. Uh, that's the case in California with the San Andreas Fault. It is a transform boundary. And that's the case in Turkey with the North Anatolian Fault. It's a, it's, a, it's a plate boundary. So here is the example from California. You see what happens here. Kinematically speaking, you have the ridge here that goes into Baja, uh, California here. Uh, goes into uh, the Gulf of California. So here you see basically the transform fault that links, yeah, the, links the ridge here. And here is very interesting. It's even more complex. It links it with uh, another transform boundary called the Mendocino transform and with a subduction zone. So you see here how this transform boundary accommodates kinematically the movement. So you see the divergence here. So this new lithosphere being formed. So this is pushed in this direction as this arrow shows. And then here you have kinematically consistency here, movement along this transform. And also you have here um, what's called the triple junction. Yeah, so kinematically you can look at this and figure out all these movements and you'll see that they are compatible. So this goes and cuts through this part of the continental um, lithosphere. And as you know, this is a, for instance, this is a surface expression of the San Andreas fault. It is a traveling fault system for the human society. 
because uh, powerful earthquakes uh, have been and can be uh, generated along it and along this complex fault system and uh, can be very destructive. So that's the idea. The one in Cherokee, similarly, uh, lots of casualties, uh, very big earthquakes. All right, so I mentioned triple junctions. Yeah, so you see a triple junction here is the points where three plate boundaries intersect. So this is a case I was just discussing in the case of the San Andreas Fault. So now you, it's just a, we zoomed in, so we blow uh, we've blown up uh, the image. So you see what happens kinematically here. Yeah. So the, this part of the plate, this uh, this uh, Juan de Fuca plate goes and is subducted here under the North American plate, and you see this uh, transform boundary here, and then you see this transform boundary here, which is a continuation of the San Andreas Fault. You see San Francisco, the city of San Francisco, which was badly affected in the past by, um, by uh, earthquakes. At the beginning of the 20th century, a very big one, for instance, 1906. All right, so uh, another example is a rich, rich, rich uh, triple junction. You see the three plates here, so you can imagine kinematically what happens. All right. Now, one more thing I wanted to discuss, which are the continental margins. So we have two types, what's called passive continental margins. They are not plate boundaries. That's why they are called passive. So nothing happens there except for the fact that the continental crust ends. Yeah, the continental crust ends. So basically, this is a passive continental margin. So you have, you have the continental shelf, which is the extension of the continent under the water here. And then you have the continental slope, which is where the continent ends. And here you can see basically uh, the uh, boundary between oceanic crust and continental crust here. So these, these, in this case, they are part of the same plate. And examples are the eastern part of the Americas. Yeah, the uh, North America, como enorme mesetas. Yeah, sure. <laughs> como enorme mesetas. If if we if we were uh, to, uh, I think mesetas you mean plateaus or something like this. I don't know exactly what the word is in. Okay, so in this case, yeah, because you have the continent. Yeah, so at some point the continent has to end. So geologically, it doesn't end where we have the shore because the water level can go up and down, or we might not have had water. The, the water is something different. What I mean to say is the actual continental mass has to end at some point. So yes, probably if you were here uh, and we are looking, you'd see, wow, what a plateau up there. That's a continent. <laughs> sure. So these are passive continental margins, eastern shore of North America, Canada, United States. Uh, Eastern shore of uh, South America. All right, in the Atlantic. Now we have the active continental margins, and these are plate boundaries. Yeah. So basically, uh, in these cases, um, you can have uh, this situation as in South America, the Pacific coast of South America. It's a continental margin. It's a continental margin. Um, so you can uh, imagine that the continent ends, but also the plate ends, because then you have the uh, Pacific uh, plates or the Nazca plate, actually the Nazca plate or the Cocos plate subducting. Now, of course, I could have said passive margins, but in this case it's passive continental margins. Maybe here I should have said just active margins, not only continental margins, because active margins, you can have what's called active margin of the Marianas type. So what you see here, basically, you have instead of a volcanic arc that is continental and a continent on the overriding plate here, you have just an island volcanic arc, like the Marianas, for instance. So, so uh, this is also an active margin. It's not continental, but it is an active margin. So that's what this diagram shows, this situation. 
So in the Pacific Ocean, you see here you have active margins with volcanic island arcs, and here in South America, you have an active continental margin. Depending if it's a continental volcanic arc or island volcanic arc. All right, so collision and mountain building, just very briefly. So you, when you get, you can imagine through the process of subduction, at some point, at some point, you can bring together two buoyant blocks of crust. So you can have on one side the, a continent, let's say, and on the other si uh, uh, side, you might have not, not only a, a continent, you can have an island arc. Yeah? You, you might have an oceanic plateau, something that, that makes the, the lithosphere too thick to be subducted and too light to be subducted. So what happens when you have a block, which could be, as I said, a continent, but it could be also an island arc, could be an oceanic plateau. When you have these buoyant blocks coming together, you have collision, basically. Now, in, of course, we call it collision in the case of continental blocks. You will see when we talk about the origins that when you have small pieces, like a little island or something, it's not really what we mean by collision. Of course, we call it accretion, like that piece goes and is added to the continent. And this is what happened to the western side of North America. Yeah, to the western side of North America, like if you go from, uh, from uh, Washington State into uh, British Columbia and Yukon, you have all these pieces that have been added in time to the continent. All right, so what happens is when you get, basically, you, can, you cannot have subduction when you have the collision of these buoyant blocks. You cannot have subduction anymore. So what happens is, at some point, uh, because the subduction cannot proceed, the convergence ceases. So, of course, you must have some reorganization of the stresses and something else that must happen um, elsewhere. But in this place, what happens is that the subducted uh, oceanic lithosphere, so you can imagine, you can have, let's say this is an island arc and this is a subducted lithosphere. So, it, and here is a continent. So it goes like this and like this. Yeah. So, and now it plugs, it, it cannot go farther. This is too buoyant. So now the subducted oceanic lithosphere will break off uh, because of its weight. And this is called slab break off and generates a lot of tectonic consequences. And people who, studied or, who study orogens, there is a lot of discussion about break off and its consequences. In many instances, consequences are, uh, first of all, you have isostatic uplift because the weight of this thing was pulling down yeah, this mass and then it breaks off, so it goes up. Also, you might have some uh, magmatism associated and all these things. So, in the case of the Alpine Himalayan mountain, this was a classic process of collision. We'll discuss about this, but just to, you know, just to have now a first idea of this process. All right, so just to summarize, just to summarize, I found these 3D diagrams. I think they are cool for you to see and to start picturing in your mind. So this shows um, the Atlantic region and the outer shells. So you can see the uh, asthenosphere and lithosphere with the, with the crust. Here is oceanic crust, here is continental crust, the lithospheric mantle. So you see here basically two types of plate boundaries you see the mid-ocean ridges, so divergent boundaries, and transform boundaries yeah, here that, that happen. But these are passive only here. There is a bit of subduction, but I'm not talking about the Caribbean region. You have passive margins here. Um, you have passive margins here. All right. So actually, I should have wrote here three types of play boundaries because I missed this zone, uh, this little zone in the uh, outer um, uh, islands of the Caribbean arc. All right, so this is one thing what I want to point out. We will discuss about the, uh, uh, the rift in the East Africa 
So this is a big graben system in East Africa, and you see this is like a triple junction in a sense because you have here you have divergent boundaries, you have spreading. The Red Sea is a new ocean that is being formed now. Is a new ocean. The question is, will the African continent split or not? So very interesting things happen. And here, let's have a look at the Pacific. At the Pacific, you see again, you see the uh, mid-ocean ridges that tr transform boundaries, and you see the subduction zones here. Uh, for instance, here is shown Fiji and, and the Fiji island arc here. Um, and um, here are the uh, Andes and the continental, active continental margin of South America. So you can study this, I think, are pretty, pretty interesting. Now, uh, what drives the movement of the plates? That's the other question. Um, the initial hypothesis, what, what people were thinking, uh, they were thinking that you have these convection cells, convective flow in the astronosphere. So they are thinking about something like this, that the movement in the astronosphere of the uh, matter here would transport the plates and would make them split apart here. If you uh, were to have two convection cells split apart here, so they, you would have a, a, a zone of divergence and then subduction. But actually it, it, it was discovered that the convective mantle flow does not match, uh, in many cases, the directions of plate motions. So there must be a different mechanism. This cannot be if, if you have places where, uh, you know, the movement uh, of the matter in the astronosphere is in a different direction, then how can you explain that? So uh, basically there are two main forces that are considered to be the drivers um, of this uh, of this process. One of them is what's called the rich push force. So the rich, rich push, imagine actually uh, the oceanic lithosphere in the mid ocean ridges is higher. Yeah. So what happens is, is the, the idea that because they are higher, they push, yeah, they're gravitationally, they push into the plate. So they, they push the plate. Uh, that's a rich push force, the mid ocean ridges. And you would have the slab pull uh, force, which would pull, uh, would be the force associated with the subducting uh, slab, yeah, the subducting slab. So basically, this is um, of the two uh, two forces. This is a more important one. It is considered that basically, of course, you have the ridge push, but the subduction here, the subduction is what pulls the lithosphere. Yeah, so. Uh, these are uh, the main forces considered to to drive the process. All right, so you can study this uh, figure. Of course, you have some basal drag and you have some friction, uh, of course. So uh, I'm just giving you the simple view. But of course, if you were to look at the balance of forces here, of course, it is a bit more complex. All right, so. Finally, because we have to end the class, uh, we have uh, 10 more minutes, uh, but I will finish uh, just two more slides uh, or three more slides. So what happens is, it, the idea is that um, Alfred Wegener, he said, okay, there was a supercontinent, Pangaea, uh, and uh, it split and the pieces drifted apart. He didn't think what happened before Pangaea. He, he thought, okay, we had only Pangaea. Tuzo Wilson, the Canadian, uh, the Canadian um, geophysicist, uh, he actually pointed out that the uh, Appalachians and the Caledonites in Europe were once an orogenic belt that actually is a record of the closure of an ocean before the Atlantic Ocean today. So the idea is, the idea is, uh, Tuzo Wilson's idea was that it, there existed a proto-Atlantic Ocean. Its closure and disappearance is reflected in what is uh, today, what are the Appalachians and the Caledonites in Europe. So this would, would be one orogenic belt uh, formed through the collision of the pre-existing masses and the closure of the proto-Atlantic Ocean 
and then a new ocean was opened more or less that split apart this uh, uh, orogenic belt and this is the Atlantic Ocean today. So on the left is the reconstruction of Tuzo Wilson in 1966. And this is a more modern reconstruction ba uh, based on, you know, computer uh, modeling and so on. So the idea is that uh, initially you would have had the closure of a pre-existing ocean, the formation of the uh, this orogenic belt, the Appalachian Caledonites, and this supercontinent called Pangaea, which split apart. Yeah. So it, we are talking about the end of uh, Paleozoic and Mesozoic. Uh, so this split apart, uh, and we have today's configuration. So this was the view that before there was another ocean, and then we had the supercontinent, and then we have the situation today. So we, as you can see here, uh, the supercontinent in Mesozoic and then splitting apart and so on. But the idea is, and here is the idea. Starting from this, Chuzo Wilson basically imagine what's today called the Wilson cycle. The, the, the idea of the cycle is that you have an ocean basin that is being formed by rifting. Now, let's say uh, the Red Sea today, yeah, or if, if the African continent splits apart. So you have an ocean basin that opens by rifting. It grows, yeah, you have seafloor spreading. Eventually, the Atlantic might develop subduction zones. And basically, through the subduction, at some point, the ocean will close because all the oceanic lithosphere will be subducted and you'll have collision and the new supercontinent being formed. So the idea was to extrapolate from these geological observations and from his idea and think in the history of the earth, we had many Wilson cycles, many situations where we had supercontinents being formed and then destroyed and formed and destroyed. And maybe linking it to a general circulation in the mantle that you see a zone of downwelling that eventually brings the, brings the continents together. And then this lid hits things up so it becomes very hot here, and this will split apart the supercontinent and so on. So people started looking at these things. And what they are seeing is basically what you see here, you see here, it's from a paper, you can read this legend. But the idea is that moments in the history of the earth when we had major periods of mountain building, yeah, in some moments, reflect formation of supercontinents. So people have discovered that before Pangaea, we had something called Panotia. Now here, it, this is an older, this is older data. So initially they are thinking is this Gondwana, they called it Panotia. Then before Panotia, you, we had Rodinia. Before Rodinia, we had Columbia. Before that in the Archean, maybe we had Sclavia or Superior and so on. So there are people who look at these things and this is called the supercontinent cycle on our planet. Very interesting. So you read the details of this uh, of these things. I, I'm just trying to show you uh, what people think today in terms of the periods of time in the history of the Earth as we go back uh, when we had different uh, supercontinents. And you see, we are here in the Proterozoic. Now, in the Archean, was it the case? Archean starts here, 2.5 billion years ago and more. We'll discuss about Precambrian geology, but I want to finish, and I'm gonna finish now uh, in two minutes, I'm finished. These are the concluding remarks. I took it as a text from a book on plate tectonics, but I think it's very good for you to, to think and to keep in mind something because you'll see later uh, when we discuss about Precambrian tectonics, that it is reflected exactly what, what these uh, authors say here. Basically, they say that uh, the theory of plate tectonics is an, what they call an actualistic model. Basically, that means it is based on the observations of the present. And here he says, he says, geologists attempt to apply this concept to mountain building throughout the Earth's history. Yeah. And this has been successful in most cases over the last two billion years 
of Earth history. So that means I was showing you down to, uh, you know, two billion years here. So people think, well, we are more or less certain that this was the case. But here, and you see the, the question mark here in the Archean, so uh, in the more ancient times, what happened? And also what they say, what these authors say, they say, um, they say numerous older mountain ranges, older than two billion years, have generated contrasting hypotheses regarding the details of their origin, because much of the initial information has been destroyed. Yeah? There were many, many events happening since then. And then he says, he says, uh, Mountain building older than 2.5 billion years does not straightforwardly conform with modern plate tectonics because the outer layers of the earth were somewhat different back then. And this is a thing that we will be discussing. It's a big controversy. You can make a career in this. It is really interesting. There are people who are very uniformitarian in their thinking and they think that the history of the plant was the same all the time. And people think, well, everything has an evolution. It cannot have been the same. So I leave you with these thoughts. I, I'm really sure you'll love tectonics because it's such a, a fascinating field of inquiry. I mean, that's how I find it, yeah? So I leave you with these thoughts. And this is it for today. Uh, these are some pages in these books for you to read and from the, um, the knowledge. And this is it. If you have questions, please don't feel shy. If you don't, feliz tarde. Nos vemos uh, martes. Um, uh, voy a estar en Webex durante uh, el tiempo de la clase. Si ustedes tienen preguntas, por favor, uh, vienen en Webex y yo puedo uh, responder a todo. ¿Sí? Gracias. Gracias a todos.